Welcome, I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Joining us for a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast now on Mental Health News Radio Network. This podcast is also available wherever you get your podcasts, but I do suggest checking out Mental Health News Radio Network to find all your podcasts related to mental health. Today's guest is Donna Piper, a former dance movement psychotherapist and certified Akashic Record healer with 20 years of experience in guiding her clients to heal unresolved trauma to create healthy relationships. She is on a mission to assist women in healing past relationship trauma by tapping into the wisdom of the Akashic Records. Through this transformative process, emotional wounds are uncovered and released in order to empower and reclaim personal power, cultivate self-love, and create healthier and fulfilling relationships. Donna, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, I I want to first ask, what is the Akashic Records? And I've never heard this before, and I'm not sh- I'm sure all of my 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 audience is curious to know what that is. Yeah, I had I've done a lot of spiritual work in it. Um, I heard it in the periphery, but I never was like, um, oh, I could become the Akashic Records healer consultant. So I totally get that there's like, what is this? So. Throughout my vast experience, um, 20 years when you said that, I was like, oh gosh, I've been doing this a while. (laughs) Um, uh, You know, I'd always worked in trauma. And as you know, and all the beautiful work that you do, that there's, it's very complex, right? It's not, and everyone has their own unique journey on how to heal and what that means to them. Um, So for all, to culminate, the Akashic Records is a like um it's an energetic blueprint of everything that your soul has ever done or will do so it's not like fortune telling it's not deemed in destiny it's just a field of energy that you can access to get information that can really heal you beyond what your mind can understand you know there's so many studies about our consciousness versus unconscious, right? And so what we think we know and what we do is like only like three to 5% depending on the studies. So that's like 95 plus percent of how we live our lives that are we're unaware of or untapped into. And you know, from all your work and stuff, your mind wants to figure things out, right? right. And sometimes that's a loop. And even if we figure it out, it doesn't really make us always feel better or the trauma hasn't been released or resolved. So the Akashic record is a very personal record to you. And once it's accessed through just like a prayer of um, like slipping into that state of consciousness, then you get information that's specific to you to help you kind of heal like in like little breadcrumbs of things so that it's not like my theory or it's not a theory and it's not a way to heal specifically, but it's really that information and then what you need to actually heal. So you could do past lives in it. You can do just um, a journey of like self-discovery, sometimes just going inside to being safe enough to feel some feelings or to remember an incident. It's not about recalling and reliving the trauma. It's about going past it to um, heal whatever is physical, emotional, mental, all of that has, that has been undigested in your consciousness. So that if it's blocking you from something or keeping you from something that it's no longer the obstacle. So then you could start to see new perspectives. That's that was amazing. a lot. I know. No, that's that, what a great, what a great explanation because, you know, what I've learned in my healing process is like you said, the subconscious, the unconscious, that is really what drives a lot of our behaviors. And so many people don't understand that. And I, you know, I didn't understand that. I had zero clue that that was, that was even a thing. And it it blows my mind how the knowledge that I've learned from just my own healing. Um, So what you said, you've had extensive work, done extensive work in trauma. What, what is your story? Why did you want to go into this? 
this field of trauma? Cause it's heavy. <laughs> It is, you know, it really is. So I kind of always was like the person that I'm really good in like a crisis situation. I grew up kind of chaotic. My parents got divorced and they were always fighting. And I was always the one in my family. I mean, I don't know if you could relate or anyone you've met, like I could like calm things down and I could see like, okay, if we do this thing, then things are going to be less mm. chaotic. So and then I was always a friend that if people had really, you know, really traumatic things that are going on or really heavy things, they would rely on me. You know, people also do it in the grocery store. Like that I'm just someone that people feel comfortable enough, fortunately, to tell their life stories to right away. Wow. And I really wanted to help people. So I kind of had that. And then in my own life, my grandfathers that I was very close to died a month apart when I was 16. And that for me was emotionally devastating. My parents didn't know how to deal with death. Um, it was kind of like, it was really horrible and sad, but no one really processed those. So um, I kind of went into, well, I did go into this very academic, very um, logical. I'm like, okay, well, because I was hurt so bad, I don't want to be hurt again, right? I think all of us that have any trauma. And so for me, just as an aside that I look at trauma as a, a significant distressing event to you, to me, it's not like it has to be in this category mm -hmm. to be traumatic. If anything happens in your life where there's a lot of emotion around it and it doesn't get processed or dissolved or felt, and it stays with you, that's trauma to yes. me. And that's unique to everyone. So that was mine. And then, um, so I went very like, okay, forget the feelings, which I don't suggest it ever, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and go right to the mind. And uh, I wasn't, I still was like not processing that. So in college, I um, found this, I was always interested in psychology and helping people. And I found this thing called dance movement therapy. And I was like, oh, that would probably be a better thing for me because it's not just talk therapy. It's also movement and all this other stuff. So I didn't know anything about dance and I got a dance degree. And then I got my master's in dance movement therapy, which um, kind of, it really did save, like, I didn't realize how depressed I was because mm -hmm. I had friends and I did things and, you know, at 16 to twenties, like. I don't know anyone really that has it all together then, you know, it's a very confusing time anyway. Yeah. Um, but until I saw like how depressed I was and how not dealing with all that grief uh, really affected me, um, then I was like, oh, this is what I'd like to do was work with trauma. And it was right at the time where somatics wasn't a thing yet, but mm. um, I worked with Vietnam veterans. I worked with when the uh, towers went down in New York. That was my introduction to being a new therapist, like right into trauma. Wow. So um, I learned a lot about that and I was very grateful. Um, but again, it's heavy, especially <laughs> right out the gate. Like, okay. Um, but really working with the 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 veterans um, really kind of melded like, okay, sometimes you just can't talk about it. Like, you know, obviously trauma is something that if you could process it and, and it all worked out, it wouldn't be affecting you now. Right. So mm -hmm. to put in words sometimes or admitting things that happen is very difficult. And for what I've seen, and it's not always the case, just because we can name it, it's that's part of it's good. But then sometimes that keeps it like isolates it in a little bubble. And like, this is my trauma. This is my story. And and it's really not. And to really get beyond that, if you would like that, is to go deeper and to really feel safe enough to feel those feelings. And that's really what the work I do and why I wanted to do it is to help people feel safe enough and the education around to feel their feelings. Because that's something that if I thought if I had when I was 16, I would have think I would have been able to process things a lot better. Yeah. Wow. Um, so when in, in the Akashic records as an Akashic records healer, is it, does it come out through, um, talk therapy or talking, um, how do you actually delve in? Is it meditation? How do you delve um, into, to someone's Akashic record? 
So for me, I've always kind of been more, everyone can access the Akashic records. It's not like a, a thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not special. It's more, it's kind of like a a, a good way to do it is like a sh if you've heard of shamanism or mm -hmm. like, you know, there's a space that people get into when you come to healing that could see other things that you can't always see, right? Mm -hmm. Even in talk therapy, we all have blind spots. Like yes. I have my blind spots. I still need to go to my teachers and mentors and people to help me. Um, and in the Kashuk records, how it, the practical, how it works is that we show up on a zoom call or in person, like we are now. And, um, you get centered into your heart and then we connect energetically. And then I say a series of words that um, open your records. And then once your records are open, then it's a interactive experience because it's also a part of what you, you're, you're an active part of your own healing. And that's what I really also like about the Akashic records and all the work is I think that we all have everything we need inside of us to heal. It's just having support for each other to figure out how to tap into that and learn what it is. So in this like journey, you go in and you just sense, feel, or imagine things that are there. And no matter how odd it may seem or like what or nothing, it's like that gives you little breadcrumbs crumbs to start to delve into what do you need? So say you were working on, say we did a session and um, you weren't even really sure where to start, but you've had been having a lot of anxiety and because most people, like I'm sure everyone listening to this podcast, you just don't always show up to someone brand new and be like, okay, these are my traumas. These are the <laughs> worst things that ever happened to me. Like, let's go in and like, let get in. It's a process and it's a process of feeling safe into your own system again. So when you go into the records, part of it is bringing in safety and support. So go to the place inside of you where you feel the most safe and supported and loved. And sometimes you don't always feel loved. So that could be harder. And then, then go into like, what's the first thing you see? Like on this, we, sometimes it's a journey where you're like, okay, there's a door. What does it look like? Go through the door to the place where the, and the intention behind it is always like, okay, where this anxiety like originated and, or sometimes it's like, that's going to give you the most information to help you right now. And then things will happen and unfold. And so what we do, it's back and forth is things are revealed to you that either you didn't know, but makes a lot of sense to you in one way. And then that gets healed and dissolved from, uh, and released from your um, consciousness or unconsciousness because so, mm -hmm. it's more conscious now. And it sounds a little like, what the heck? <laughs> how does that really happen? And how, but because you know, everything is energy. We're all made up as energy, you know, just how mm -hmm. fast things come together, makes bodies, makes, you know, tables, microphones, it's all on a frequency. When you work in energetics and especially something like the Akashic records, then you can dissolve in that frequency and then it gets released mm -hmm. and it happens. And then you have that experience yourself. And so you could do it on your own. Um, and then from there, you start to build more trust and confidence and safety within. And then, as you know, like safety and trust and support is like the foundation you need to in life to accept yourself, to do whatever, but also just in healing and in relationships. And the more you can find that in yourself and have your own agency and feel safe no matter where you are in the world and what you're doing and know that you can have the ability to respond to your environment, then that frees up these little parts that you don't have to be so protective over anymore. And it starts to dissolve. It's so it's digestive in that way. So it just, it gets released. And then, um, then once the session is over, your records are closed and then you have some time to process it, but it's just kind of, even though it seems a little bit out there, um, it's actually a very practical tool because again, you know, if, if I'm a practitioner and, and then I think, oh gosh, okay, I think you need X, Y, and Z. I'm placing on what you need, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're a very like, 
okay, let's, I want to do this. I'm very open and you go with it, but I push your limits beyond what you could do. That's not great for your healing either. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this way, it gives you just what you need. It's not, I'm telling you like, this is what I think you need and I'm not doing this. And also for trauma, I think it's important, um, especially men and women, but women too, is to feel like they have their own voice and they're in charge of their own healing. And that becomes like, okay, I can create my own safety. I can be my own advocate. And what does that really mean? Because those are words we talk about a lot, but it's like in practice, like, what does that really mean? You know, like, yeah. When, when are you your own advocate? When does that really help you? When is it like, when can you speak up? And so this gives you just another layer to heal on top of whatever else you're wanting to do. Yeah. You know, it really reminds me of like hypnotherapy or for me, I went through so much internal family systems therapy, IFS, and really um, healing the root cause of some of the behaviors. Right. And, and I did some integrative work with psychedelics and um, internal family systems therapy, where I was able to just drop into my subconscious very easily. And now I feel like I can just drop into my subconscious really easily and realize a lot of things, which obviously now has given me more awareness in in the certain behaviors and certain feelings that I have. Um, But, you know, what I want to kind of get into, we were, I know we were going, we're focusing on self-acceptance and I think a lot of it is the awareness, right? And understanding why do we feel so isolated or like, why can't we just accept ourselves? This is like I, I was saying to you before um, um, we started the podcast is it's a, it's really an ongoing process. And, but, but I feel like you've, you've done, you've focused, you focused, you have a lot of focus around self-acceptance. And so I wanted to talk to you about that and why self-acceptance is such a big part of healing as well as other relate, you know, creating relationships. So self-acceptance is something that I like always struggled with myself. I was very much a perfectionist on that spectrum. So kind of anything in my life was if it's, if I got like a B or something, I was very dramatic and everything was very upsetting to me, like my whole, like, and I'm like, unless it was perfect, which perfect is a concept that is like not attainable. And if you're perfect, then there's no room for growth, but kind of how my system was always geared in my mind is like, even if I accomplished like, like the highest thing I could, I always thought, well, it's, that was kind of easy. I I should do better. So I was never in that state of self-acceptance. It was always, I should do more. It should be better. All of those things. And then it got to be like, just kind of like too much, like crushingly, like, you know, like you can't live up to any, and there were my own standards. It was my own thing. It wasn't like it was external. Was there any, so there wasn't any like expectations put on you by parents or anybody? No, No. I think that was probably, I've kind of always tried to figure this out and I don't know if I'll ever (laughs) know, but my parents were always like, do whatever you'd like. We have fully, um, we give you carte blanche on whatever you wanted to do. Cause I think my mother's philosophy was if I tell you what to do, then you're going to rebel. And I really want it to be from what you want to do. Not again, not as a reaction to me, Mm. but my system as a kid, like I like structure. So I want to be able to be, okay, what are my (laughs) let's <laughs> give me the bullet points of what I need to accomplish. And I feel safe in that way. So having like such a, like that it's beautiful, like that she was so yeah. like, yeah, I'll support you in whatever. And she has that made me not have a baseline of what to fall back on. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah. So it kind of, I was always doing more. I never really knew. I didn't have parameters or right. you that. didn't have boundaries where you I didn't have boundaries. Where... Like I knew like, okay, then I'm achieving more or less. It was just always achieving. Right. And 
that started to spiral against me. And I was like, you know, I accomplished all this stuff, whatever. And then I still didn't feel good about myself. So I was like, what is that? And then I'm like, do I just like have a black mark on my soul? I was very like, Mm. what is going on? So I went into a very, um, about 15 years of, of, this focus on spirituality, like all of the things that I read, everything, like, how do you live that? Like, how do you live a balanced life? Like, how do you look at, how do you be and do like all of those concepts, all, you know, any book you might ever read about self growth or like, um, Buddhism, Zen, any of all that stuff. How do you be a loving, compassionate person? Right. Mm -hmm. We all, I, or most, I think everyone wants that, but like, you know, when, you know, my husband does something annoying or like <laughs> neighbors are calling you to, you know what I mean? Like those, my emotions about what was going on didn't jive with what I wanted. So I had to go on this journey and I found a spiritual teacher that really delved into self-acceptance. And I finally knew, I finally like, like, okay, if I can't accept myself, then no one else can. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, as much as we're about like this plane, we're all about relationships. However, if I can't receive my own love and my own, and not like just self-love, but if I can't receive those words, if I can't accept who I, if I can't accept my own mistakes, if I can't accept my own perceived darkness, then no one else is going to like And I was always in this loop and a lot of women that I work with too, that's probably why they find me is that they were looking for an external thing going, okay, well, I accept you no matter what, if it's more external, like if I can be accepted externally by someone either loved, or if the partner, if this magic partner comes and drops down and just (laughs) knows exactly all my needs and meets them exactly, then I'll feel accepted. And you know, that's a lie. That's a lot of BS. It's never going to happen, right? You know, we have our two worlds. We all are going through our own stuff. So the more I was in my meditations and the more I was like, okay, I accept myself totally and said that over and over a lot. Then I started to feel more comfortable in my skin. And then I was able to look at things like, okay, what do I feel most shame and guilt about, right? And (laughs) is that even something to really is it shameful or guilty? I've never done anything really bad in my, you know, bad in my life against someone. So what are these things? And, um, if I can't accept them, then no one that I will ever love or who loves me is going to, you know, I'm not going to allow them in that much because if we look, if you look at other people in your life, I know I have like, like, the things that I think maybe were not, I can't really think of a good example right now, but maybe you can, but like, you know, like, I don't know, I can't think of it, but I don't look at my husband or other people in the world and like list like, oh, I love them. But this one thing is the one thing that is like the thing that's the deal breaker. Right. Right. But internally, a lot of times (laughs) (laughs) we think like, oh, that's the thing. That's the deal breaker. Like you know, and it's just, and it is really all about us in a, in a very yes. positive way, because if I can't receive love, I can only give, you know, we all think we can give a lot of love out and we can, but we also have to be able, there's a opposite to that, to receiving. So if you are able to receive just as much love as you get out, that's when it becomes balanced. That's when you grow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like if you're like, Oh, I'll love you here, but I won't accept it. Then that's an imbalance in you. And then it's not, and then becomes conditional. Yeah. So self-acceptance is really just totally accepting yourself. Doesn't it sound like such a free thing? Like, yes. right. For me, like so that is, I think that's what keeps me going because that moment and the more I've accepted things that I've done and they're really just like, Oh, why didn't I do this thing sooner? Or like I moved from Chicago to to LA like should I have stayed in Chicago because I had this one practice and you know like just things that aren't really relevant to my life like really like just mm-hmm. things to look for to make me feel bad about myself mm. but and I and with trauma specifically shame and guilt keep that trauma in that loop 
right? It, like feeds it. Feeds it because mm-hmm. even if you didn't do anything wrong and you never do anything wrong, but you know, like that's a thing like, like oh, well, I might've did something to have this thing happen to me. And that's new agey BS. I mean, I know I'm in the Akashic records, but I don't believe that, um, you like bring bad things upon yourself. You know, like, I don't think like, oh, if, if I, sh- I should have thought this thought, if I don't have that, so, you know, a lot of people do mindset work and that's the catch like, oh, well, maybe I'm not doing the right mindset work, or maybe I'm not doing a, this, or if I had only do that. And it, those d- things that if you assess it like that, then it looks at something wrong and then you can't, and then it keeps, it makes it harder to accept yourself. Does that make right. sense? Yes, or- that does. You know, that could be a trap like, oh, you know, these people that have these lives and it's all together, they must think X, Y, and Z, you know, wake up and do this routine that's perfect. And, you know, Mm. that's all like some people it works for, but really when you have trauma that you look for, your body is seeking um, ways to release that trauma and dissolve it. So we go naturally through um, a system that we're not aware of that creates this, this energy, these neurotransmitters to protect ourselves in trauma. Then your body naturally cycles through that again to discharge it. But because we're so smart, we could stop that process. And that's what kind of gets, and the more we stop it, the more that protection builds up around that incident. And then it becomes potentially not, um, something that becomes an obstacle in our lives other than a protection. Cause our emotions, our ego, everything in our body is for us to survive. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's not against us. It's for us to survive. And we create behaviors and everything around. Cause obviously we don't want to feel like that again, right? right? If it's something that we don't want to feel or uncomfortable. So it's going beyond that and working with that to really feel safe and supported and feeling safe and supported has to do with Mm self-acceptance because, you know, and it's just that they all kind of blend together, but, um, really because you can't hate yourself and grow. You can't condemn yourself and want something different. The only way to really heal is to accept what happened. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I've been guilty of like, oh, I wish that didn't happen. I, why did that happen to me? I don't want it to have happened to me if only. And that just keeps the trauma, the hurt alive, Mm -hmm. resisting it. Yes. Once you feel supported and able to feel those feelings, they're, they don't take as long as they're, and they're not as devastating as you think they will be. And then that moves through. So then you can really start to, okay, like, like you really, you can't like, I hate this thing about me. And I, if that thing goes away, then it'll all be better. And that's just not how it works. No, unfortunately. So that's why I do a big thing about self-acceptance because, um, you know, it's part of you and to really see what that, what that means. I mean, you can't, yeah, like you said, you can't heal. You can't heal if you don't accept yourself, accept the circumstances and accept what happened, happened. Um, You know, for me, it was, you know, I had the opposite for my parents had expectations. Things needed to be perfect. If they weren't perfect, then you failed. It's like, there was no way around that. And so I would just, and I, 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 I obviously dealt with trauma along the way. So I was just like getting everything wrong. You know, I was diagnosed with with ADHD when really I was just dis- disassociating right from my own mm-hmm. trauma. And it, you know, so I had the opposite. I, I guess there's, there's like this middle ground in parenting where <laughs> it's like, you need boundaries, but you can't be so like strict and, and this, this, the whole idea of perfection is just not real. Um, and, and so in doing so, I'm just wondering, cause for me and my daughter, do- my daughter, she's eight, you know, and I liked what you said about, you know, it's, it's not, it's not about you. Like when someone else is being not so nice, 
you know, I think she takes it on and she's, she's like, something's wrong with me when the truth is, and I tell her this all the time, like they're probably going through something. So, you know, let's, let's kind of, and, and I don't know if you have an answer, like, what can I tell her? And like self-acceptance is something that I want her to understand early on and not necessarily like have to deal with it later in her forties. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, okay. So two things, one, none of us go come out of childhood unscathed. I think that's yes. just the, a part of like, you know, whatever our learning is in this lifelong, you know, in life, like it comes to us, right? Mm -hmm. Like we both had the same experience with different parenting, mm -hmm. right? right? Like I, like I had a few friends that their parents were like all over them and like, this is what you do. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I really wish I had that. And they wanted my parent, you know, it's right. just like, um, yeah, I you want know, your so parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, you guys have expectations and it's this and it's clear. So, um, <laughs> and they're like, oh, I love that your mom is just like supportive no matter what. So, so that I think part of it is that you're always doing the best you can as a parent. So even as parents out there, if you also have children and don't want them obviously you don't want them to have the same sort of hurts and you know that you've gone through but also know that they have also their own path so you're doing the best that you can and you know what they need to go through is what they need to go through so trust that the other thing is is that this is like the meditation I give my clients and I talk about all the time and I don't know if you want to do this with your daughter I think it's a really good one but you start out and you just say it out loud is like I accept my, like we'll start with I am good I'm a good girl and then I am good and then I am those things over and over is just like breaks down so it's like five, 10 minutes and it's just, I am a good girl or boy. And you just breathe that in and you do it over and over. She could do it out loud or to herself and then change after a few minutes to, I am good. And then I am, and then end it with, I accept myself totally. I accept myself totally. I accept myself totally. And even though there is not like those words over and over in a while, then it starts to seep in and it does something to your um, conscious and your brain, you know, how our brain seeps in and thoughts. And it really starts to give you a su support, even if you don't accept yourself totally. It's not one of those things where, you know, you can't lie to yourself. Like if <laughs> right. you really don't like, if you really don't like if love you yourself. yourself. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people hate themselves. No amount of, I love myself will do a bit of good, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to get to the part of like to the opening of like, okay, why don't I love myself? Why do I dislike myself? Why am I saying these hateful things to myself? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And deal with that. So that that kind of meditation or just saying it over and over again. Um, she can look in the mirror. It depends on, you know, but just those things over and over again for days and days, then it seeps into her her, your consciousness, her consciousness that you are good. And then you can accept yourself. I don't really go into good and bad, but we are split, especially being taught things in school, you know, societally there's good and bad, right? Mm -hmm, right. As much as I could say, no, there's not, it's not true. It's like, you have to work with what the realism and we've split stuff into, oh, I'm bad. Oh, I'm good. Mm -hmm. That's just what we do. So yeah. the more you use that language and just say that you're good and not focus on the bad thing, then it'll start to come in and you can accept yourself. And how old is your daughter? If you, you don't want eight. eight. Yeah. So yeah, she's like kind of not in that um, area where, you know, she's a teenager, right? Right. <laughs> I want to get to, I want to figure this out before we get to the teenage yeah. part. <laughs> so I would just gently say that because again, like she's probably very, um, you know, picks up on people's feelings yes, and absorbs them. Empathic, yes. Yes. So then that's always, um, more of a challenge, but just let her, you know, just to educate her that, you know, these aren't what you're saying is true, but just like, okay, you don't have to absorb everyone's pain in the world. Yeah. Right. 
And a lot of people that have a lot of trauma also absorb a lot of pain. You know, it, trauma is an interesting thing. And I really do look at it as a gift in some respects. And if, and I don't want to trigger anyone out there, but the, the amount of pain and amount that it, um, the enormous expansion of that pain that is there with trauma also on the flip side gives you a huge capacity to love mm. and a huge capacity to be compassionate and a huge. So it's not, so look at like all of the, how the pain has gone through or how big maybe that wound is. And also know that as you go through it, that is also a superpower for you to love and to give people to understand. Mm -hmm. So yes. it creates expansion, but it also can, in also can create the expansion into the, you're just a tremendous amount to feel. And then putting, I don't want to say boundaries in a bad way, but putting boundaries in this. So you can like, okay, this is mine and that's theirs. And I could be there for them, but I don't have to fix them. I don't have to overstep myself to mm -hmm. Yeah. really like make everything okay. I can use all that energy and look at how much love I can give myself and I can start to accept myself even greater. And then from that place, then I can go out and help people and spread love and spread whatever I want to spread. So other than, you know, a lot of times we always attend, have a tendency to give out because maybe we think like we should, or we don't want to be a bad person or whatever. But like, if you could take all of that pain and transmute it into love and give it to yourself first, that is extremely powerful. Yeah. You know, I, I did an interview, I think it was, it was last season or the season before um, I spoke with a former hockey player uh, for the Vancouver Canucks. Um, Dave Scatcherd, and he went, he got dementia very early on due to um, several concussions. And he said to me that, because now he's a life coach and he works with high performing athletes, but he said specifically one day he like, he, he was very suicidal and he asked God, why, why is, why am I going through this? And he said that he felt that in his heart, God said, I, I had to put you through this. So you know what it feels so you like, so you can help others. And I was like, wow, that's so profound because he was saying before, like any of all the bad stuff happened, all the trauma and all the um, physical trauma, he, he would just tell other people, oh, just, just shake it off. Just, you know, just push through it. And he had to go through it in order to be able to understand what other people are going through and so you know now he's doing something bigger than himself bigger than you know what he planned on doing which was just to play hockey so I I, I do believe that because even for me I'm in this place where I'm doing something that I love and and I'm help you know I'm helping as many people as I can as I, I can or um I'm able to and you know this you know, I, prior to this, I was just working, you know, I was a, I worked in PR. I did like, I worked on the news and I wasn't happy. <laughs> and so, um, the healing, healing really does open up, even though there's that wound and there's that quote, you know, the wound is where the light enters. Um, mm -hmm. and I totally believe that. Yeah. It, it's so true. Cause that is like really kind of gives you the opening to do, to see what your passion is to help people because, you know, a really, you know, even like for you, your daughter, anyone out there, like when you take on a lot of feelings, you can also just do like, are these my feelings or are they someone else's? And mm. you could just say, okay, anyone's feelings that aren't mine, they, I send them back to you lovingly and I take back any of my feelings that I have left with someone else lovingly. And that also kind of can help that energy flow because when you are giving so much like you do and you know, anyone of the, your listeners as well, you also want to find that, that good balance for you, right? Because you don't want to also be drained and it also doesn't want to like, you know what I mean? So I don't no, know. I mean, that's, that's a great way to, to really work with it. Right. Because I think there were times where I just absorbed, 
you know, a friend who's going through a lot's energy and I just held on to that. And then, but I like that idea of just, yeah, just letting it go. give back theirs, take it back yours. And, um, and, you know, if you could do that every day or after, especially if you, um, with some clients or something, that's a lot, really heavy stuff. It's a really good way to clear just your energy because also, um, you know, we have our own stuff, right. Always to, <laughs> yeah, right. to work on. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And really, cause you know, relationships are, they're so reflective of what's going on with us. Right. Mm-hmm. So really, um, and that's why I like working with relationships so much. So it, it illuminates what is, like if I'm annoyed with my husband or something happens with my friend or something happens, it illuminates. Okay. So it's, it gives me an opportunity to see like, why do I have this tr- button? Like, okay, mm-hmm. they're my buttons, you know? So how can I dissolve them? What do I need to look at? Is it uh, an older trauma? Is it a relationship um, like issue with my parents? Or is it just some yeah. crazy belief that I just, has stuck in my head that it has to be this way. Yeah. Right. So there's so many uh, opportunities. And that's the other thing why I like the Akashic records is because it also gives you a lot of perspectives. The Akashic records is really there to shift your, help you shift your perspective to see all the different ways to do things. Cause we yeah. get so locked in. I mean, I know patterns. my own pain and client, like we're just in it. Right. Mm-hmm. It, like, you know, sometimes trauma could be like any pain. Like if you have a toothache, you really know about that tooth. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when the toothache's gone, you don't, you don't feel those teeth, right. You're not obsessed. So Mm -hmm. it's when we're so locked into things, we can't see the other beauty. We can't see all of these other things. And I am, I really think you have to go through all the steps even though I said earlier, trauma could be a definitely gift. I don't believe that if you don't go through all the healing things that you're just going to be like, Oh, trauma is like so great. You, you don't want to, like for me and the work that I do is learning how to feel feelings was the biggest. Um, it seems simple, but they don't teach us in school. They should how to really feel a feeling and let yourself mm. sit and feel that feeling in your body. All feelings, once they get processed, and I learned this in my, when I was in my um, master's program is like, they all go back to joy. So the sadness, the guilt, everything, if you allow the feeling to be felt for like max 10 minutes, you don't even need to go that far. Then it dissipates feeling just want to be felt. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot. Like I don't should, you shouldn't be angry. You should be polite, you know, all of that stuff. Like, don't be sad, like, you know, whatever. And it, if you give yourself a space and a way and learn how to feel them, and then you can teach other people how to feel feelings. And then it doesn't get like pushed down because it's always going to come out somewhere. Right. And you said like when your daughter's 40, like when I worked with veterans, <laughs> it was usually because they retired in their fifties and sixties. So all the stuff that they were doing to keep themselves together That's when they it. didn't have that thing anymore then all the feelings and all the stuff comes up. So the sooner you can process them, the sooner you can learn, then it doesn't have to build. And then it doesn't have to be such a heavy weight for you and, or any of us. So I think that was probably, um, the, one of the biggest things also is to feel safe enough to learn how to feel these feelings. And that's why, Mm -hmm between the Akashic records and doing trauma work, you start to allow yourself to kind of uh, allow that little shell to dissolve around it. And then you can be like, okay, this, then it could be processed and then you could be free of it. Wow. Yes. Well, <laughs> Donna, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um. No, I mean, I talked a lot, but really anyone listening and anyway, they just really just know that you are not alone. you did nothing wrong. There is nothing bad or innately wrong with you to have whatever experience you've had and to really start to look at it um, as, okay, this is somehow I'm going to be benefited or I need to get 
some information from this, somehow there's a positive and just mm -hmm. seek out people to support you in whatever way you need. So you can find your path to healing. There's so many, um, things available now than ever before. Yeah. And and find one or a combination of people and practices to do and know that it'll evolve and um, that you're not alone and to seek help, to really reach out. Yes, absolutely. Donna, thank you so much for, for the knowledge and joining me today. I I really appreciate it. And I'm absolutely going to try that meditation with my daughter. So I'll, I'll, I'll be work. I'll be working on some things. So Let thank me you. I will. I will. Thank you. That was Donna Piper, certified Akashic record healer. For more information on her, check out the show notes. You'll find her website there. November's issue of Authentic Insider is out. Donna contributed to October's issue. Check out Authentic Insider at TraumaSurvivorThriver.com. That's TraumaSurvivorThriver.com, as well as past episodes of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my email list to get Authentic Insider magazine in your inbox monthly. I will be speaking at the Wonderland Conference in Miami, November 9th through the 11th. Please go ahead and, and sign up if you are interested. It's the glo premier global event for psychedelics, mental health, and longevity. So if you're looking for discounted tickets, check out the show notes for the link and use Lori Lee 24, your promo code. We will be back next week when I speak with Christina Wood, CEO and founder of Woods Hypnotherapy and Coaching, when we discuss self-sabotage, why we do it, and how to break the cycle. You've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. I'm Lori Lee Binstock. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. Take care. Yeah.